Police and Gauteng education officials are trying to establish how a knife ended up in the hands of a school pupil resulting in the stabbing incident that left at least one learner dead. The incident occurred at Taba Jabula Secondary School in Pinville on Thursday. Newsroom Africa's Malungelo Boy is standing by for us from the school in Pinville. So Malu, uh, what have you been able to ascertain? What more do we know? Well, perhaps let's go to, let's start here, Duduzila. When we arrived here this morning at around 6 o'clock and we saw pupils coming into school, there were a lot of parents outside. And when pupils were entering the school premises for the first time, really, there were police officers and some parents who were searching the pupils, ensuring that there is actually no weapon entering the school premises as well as drugs or any other illegal substance. Also though, we've heard from some of the pupils who actually saw what happened on Thursday during break time. They told us that the deceased was in fact stabbed four times on the upper body as well as on the neck and he was rushed to hospital and unfortunately he lost his life. We have been told by the pupils who actually witnessed the incident that bullying was really at the heart of what happened on Thursday and of course pupils saying to Duzila that they have been left traumatized by what happened and also pupils actually to Duzila telling us that you know bullying at this school has reached alarming levels saying that in the afternoons in fact they would see a number of parents coming to the school coming to complain about their children being bullied by fellow learners this is something that was also confirmed by the education department that it seems as if bullying is a problem at this particular school but what we've also noticed to when we are when we got here we spent an entire day here to we saw there's a lot of late coming that is taking place here and that's something that parents and education officials have also noted saying that that's something that has got to be addressed as a matter of urgency. Dudazile? Absolutely. Uh, Malungelo, listening in on this conversation is Professor Kathy Ward. Uh, she's with the psychology department at the University of Cape Town. And perhaps let's uh, um, introduce her into the conversation and just expand on this and try and understand the psychology behind this if possible, right? So, Professor Ward, thank you very much for availing yourself this afternoon. As we just heard from Malungelo Boy saying that bullying at this particular school, at least, uh, has reached alarming levels. If it is not teachers who are shot by pupils on the driveway, it's pupils a driveway of schools at that. It's pupils who are uh, committing uh, these crimes against each other on school premises. Have we reached crisis levels or have we always been here, just not paying attention? Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Uh, you know, the, the, the question of has it got worse? Um, have we reached crisis levels? I, I, I think a death is a signal that we are in a crisis. But whether it's got worse over the years, that's a question we actually can't answer. Um, there have been school violence surveys that were done, um, I think the last one may have been done about 10 years ago and then uh, five years before that. So we don't have any data that's recent and national that can tell us whether things have got out of hand. Um, what those two surveys, which were run by the Centre for Justice and Crime Prevention, um, what they showed was that violence had stayed pretty stable in schools that um, that that uh, you know that that violence, uh, in a sense, was a normative part of a, a normal part of a school day for, for learners. Um, those two surveys both showed, for instance, that that half the children in South Africa reported being beaten by a teacher, even though it's against the law, and a number of them reported bullying. And um, and so I think our schools are in fact very violent places, unfortunately. Uh, and, and, uh, and when we see a death of anybody, it is something that we should be very concerned about. Malungelo also pointed out to late coming, where pupils come in late, which speaks to discipline, not just on the part of the school, but on the part of the parents. Where are we in these conversations? Do you perceive, or from the work that you do, that parents are hands-on? You know, that's going to vary across communities. Um, and... 
And I think there are many things that, that schools can try to get parents more involved. For instance, having parent-teacher meetings, say, on Sunday afternoons, which are not days that are used for funerals or for shopping, because parents have many, many demands on their time and aren't always able to make it to PTA meetings. But by the same token, um, parents, uh, you know, sometimes schools can't make it uh, convenient enough for parents, and then, and then parents won't be involved in parent-teacher meetings. I think it takes quite a bit of work on the part of the school sometimes then to involve those parents. I think, though, this also speaks to the need for learners to be supervised by adults all the time on the school grounds. Now, these incidents where somebody dies are relatively rare, and it may be impossible for supervision to prevent that kind of incident, which might happen very quickly. Um, but I think what we do know from the research around the world is that a whole school policy which says zero violence is tolerated, children are supervised by adults all the time, non-violent discipline methods are used by schools, by, by the teachers, so that it runs all the way through the, the school in every area of the school, that will lower the likelihood of the more serious episodes. Hmm. On the other hand, I think schools, uh, I'm just going to say one thing and then you can butt in again. No worries. I think school, schools are often in very violent communities where there's a lot of gang activity and managing gang activity is well beyond the remit of a school. And so it's about having uh, the whole of society, the parents, the teachers, um, the, the, the learners signing up to a no violence uh, policy, the police supporting that. And I think one of the things that we see in South African society is all of these services, teachers, police, parents, are stretched very thin. And that's part of, I think, what is going, going wrong here. Hmm. It's interesting that you speak of nonviolent ways of disciplining uh, children, right? And you speak of the environment informing uh, the kind of pupil that will end up being in front of a teacher. However, there is an argument to be made about um, other learners who will go to so-called affluent schools where the parents will work themselves to the bone to make sure that their child has the best education. However, as a result of the parent not being in the uh, life's child or being as active, then they play out whatever scene uh, at schools and then you find that teachers are disempowered uh, while we speak on this nonviolent way of disciplining children is there space for a conversation in South Africa about corporal punishment but reinventing it right where it's nonviolent and um, so I think I think two two things there that you're talking about one is we know that is incredibly robust in the in the science of, of what makes children succeed is that parents being involved in their children's school life is really important. So parents actually doing what they can to meet the teacher. So maybe if they can't make a formal PTA, trying to make a time with, that, with the teacher so that they can have that link between home and school. And at the very least, making sure that homework is done is really important in a child's life. And that's what makes schools succeed. That's make learners succeed. Um, yeah, and so then the other issue is corporal punishment. Yes, there is definitely room for a conversation about corporal punishment and giving both parents and teachers skills for nonviolent disciplines. So hitting children, yelling at them, screaming at them um, should not be necessary. Um, uh, and there should be alternatives like um, keeping children in during break time or after school, um, and a range of other ways of setting up a classroom so that children know that there are limits on their behavior and that doesn't have to spill over to violence. Um, I do want to recognize, though, that, that, that teachers that are working in, in areas where parents work very long hours um, and they can't make that connection or where there is a long, lot of gang activity are starting in a place where perhaps the dice is loaded against them. I wouldn't like to see that becoming an excuse, though. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that things can be done in terms of setting that, that no violence policy across the whole school. Um, the other things we do know, just to, to go back to the, to the gang and the bullying a little bit, is that we know that children who carry weapons are often children who feel unsafe at school. And so there should be a zero bullying policy and parents and teachers working together 
to work with children to stop them from being bullies or being bullied. And, and that, I think, um, is something that can possibly be achieved. They're, they're, uh, it, but it has to do, again, with about role modeling nonviolent ways to solve problems. Uh, Prof, I recently attended a school meeting, right, and I digress a little bit, but it's got to do with the conversation where a teacher actually said when one of the parents brought up the issue of bullying, uh, the teacher said, mm -hmm. well, it's a situation where the children will be playing and at one point the one will say, oh, well, it's bullying. Um, so with regards to maybe orientation or teaching children, are we doing that enough where we have these programs uh, in schools, not only to dissuade them, but to make them understand the consequences? Um, I think we certainly could do more. To the best of my knowledge, and I do stand to be corrected, there are no evidence-based bullying programs being delivered in South African schools. And when I say evidence-based, I mean the science shows us that they work. And, uh, and we would want that because that means that we're getting the very best for, for uh, children, for teachers, for parents. Um, we need something that the science has shown works, has worked, and to the best of my knowledge, there's, there's very little that is being delivered along those lines. Um, part of it is helping children solve interpersonal problems, and so if, some, if somebody, say, bumps into you, not immediately taking offence at that, because it might have been a mistake. And so teaching children those skills to go... Uh, you, you know, I didn't appreciate being bumped into and allowing the other person to say, I'm really sorry, it was a mistake, and then accepting that is something that they need to learn to do and, again, that they need to see well modelled around them by the adults around them. And we have to recognise that we live in one of the most violent societies in the world. Um, interpersonal violence is the third leading cause of death in South Africa, um, and, and, that, and that rate is several times the global average. So we are living in one of the most violent societies, and we should, we should be, you know, while it's absolutely horrifying, we should, should perhaps not be surprised when it spills over into the school grounds. Hmm. I do wish we had more time to explore uh, the impacts on social media on all of this as well, on our learners. But for